Hi, everybody. Tom Kalinske has had a career as the king of brands. Tom first became well-known for marketing Flintstone vitamins and then reviving Barbie and Hot Wheels at Mattel and then launching Masters of the Universe. In the games industry, and perhaps most famously, Tom's efforts to turn around Sega of America were chronicled in the book and recent CBS documentary, Console Wars. Tom famously turned around the Sega console business, growing Sega of America from $72 million to more than $1.5 billion in revenue. Welcome, Tom. Thank you, Joseph. It's good to be with you. <laughs> I thought we could first start by actually talking, kind of going back into your career and talking about sort of one of the first achievements that kind of made you famous, which was when you helped market Flintstone's vitamins. Can you take us back to that experience and, and maybe tell us a little bit more about kind of the backstory behind the, the Flintstones vitamins. How was it conceived? And then how did you market the, the, the vitamins? Sure. So that takes me all the way back to 1968. I was out of uh, graduate school and I joined a part of J. Walter Thompson Advertising Agency in New York City that developed new products for existing clients. And one of their clients was Miles Laboratories, the, the guys who make One A Day Vitamins and Alka-Seltzer. And they also made a, vi a children's chewable vitamin called Chalks, which was a square chocolate flavored vitamin. Well, one day, Bristol Myers, their competitor, came out with PALS vitamins, which were multicolored, fruit flavored, animal shaped vitamins. And guess what? The Chalks business literally fell off a cliff. It just disappeared. It went from you know fifty million dollars to nothing. And uh, so the one a day people, or excuse me, the Miles Laboratories people said to us, you got to develop a new vitamin for us uh, that we can compete with Bristol Myers Pals vitamins with. And so we did all this research, the Jamal Thompson Company also had a big research group, an arm, and we researched every conceivable theme and, uh, you know, character and what have you. And actually the winning concept, this will surprise you, was actually Snoopy and his <laughs> characters. Well, Snoopy was already taken for nutritional products by Interstate Baking, and the, the brand that came, or the characters that came in second were Flintstones. And yet at the time, Flintstones was a prime time animated television show. I don't know if you guys can remember that, but it was sort of like a, a, a takeoff of the Jackie Gleason Honeymooners show, only in animated form with Fred Flintstone and Wilma and Barney and, uh, and uh, the Flintmobile and what have you. So anyway, that was the, the second choice. So we go out to Miles Laboratories in Elkhart, Indiana, and we had all these drawings of what Flintstones vitamins would look like. And we presented it to the management there, and they looked at us and said, you guys are nuts. You don't know, <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. The show just went from primetime to Saturday morning, which was true. It had been canceled off primetime. It was now on Saturday morning. And we said, well, that, that's good. That means more kids are going to see it. And they basically threw us out of the room and said, go do your more research. So we did. We did more research. And uh, it came out, this time we didn't, we didn't include Snoopy. And it, the Flintstones came out number one. So we go back out there and we say to these uh, executives, who were mostly doctors, by the way, okay. at uh, Miles Laboratories, we say, you got to do Flintstones vitamins. And uh, the head doctor was a guy named Ollie Joy. We used to call him O Joy. And he, he looked at us and he said, well, if that's the best you guys can do, uh, you'll have to come out here and live here in Elkhart, Indiana, and put this together as a brand, and, uh, and then we'll do it. So that basically is what happened. I went out to Elkhart and spent quite a bit of time out there. I used to fly back and forth between New York and Elkhart almost every week. And, uh, and we, we introduced Flintstones. We obviously did the pa packaging. Obviously, Miles did the nutritional content of the vitamins. Right. And uh, we introduced it with a very catchy uh, animated, what was the first time I think a rotoscope uh, a commercial had been done with using rotoscope, which was we shot on a green screen, which is very common today. And we included the Flintstones characters doing things with real children, you know, climbing a mountain next to Fred Flintstone singing, yabba dabba doo, yabba dabba doo, Flintstones vitamins are good to chew. And uh, it caught on and it literally became the number one vitamin in a few weeks and surpassed Miles Pal's vitamins. And the strange thing is all these years later, now we're talking about introducing this in 1969, um, 
it's, it's still the number one children's chewable vitamin. Yeah, I remember eating those vitamins when I was a kid as well, but you know, that's great. So it sounds like even from those days, there was a focus on data and research and things of that nature. And I think in the, in the mobile gaming industry, which where I'm from, that's a big focus is on research and things and making sure we're as data driven as possible. But was there any, during that time, was there any part of you that, was it just about the data? Was it just the research or was there any kind of gut feeling to the, the vitamins as well? Well, no, I think it was both data, obviously the research proved the data, but it was also a gut feeling because I will tell you most of the so-called experts, and this is sort of a common theme uh, that I've run across, the experts in the industry, and in this case, it was the, the vitamin industry and the licensing industry, they thought this was a bad idea. Uh, but my feeling was that it was an excellent idea. And as I said a minute ago, the fact that children were now watching it on Saturday morning was a good thing, not a bad thing right. uh, for, for Miles Laboratories. And so my, my gut said, this is something we, we need to do and, and we need to stick with it. And of course they did. Then like in terms of the next phase in your career, in terms of the story behind Barbie and Hot Wheels, could you take us back to that time and how did you revive those brands? And what did you see in those brands in particular that got you excited about trying to turn those around? Sure. By the way, Flintstones in a way introduced me to Mattel. Okay. Because uh, in, uh, in 1969, I was, uh, the Senate subcommittee on children's advertising was formed. And the senators were mad at toy advertising and cereal advertising and candy advertising. And somehow we got thrown into that mix. And so we were called before the Senate subcommittee in Washington, D.C., which was a very unpleasant experience because the senators sit on these mahogany desks kind of up high above you. And you're down on your, your folding iron chair in front, on a formica table, very uncomfortable, usually with a lawyer next to you. And the senators are asking you questions. And so it was, they really crucified Kellogg's and General Mills and, and a lot of the toy guys, Mattel uh, was there. And then at one point, Senator Char Margaret Chase Smith of Maine pointed at me and she said, so, Mr. Kalinske, you think selling drugs to children is a good idea? And I said, well, Senator, I'm sure you're aware that uh, moms try their darndest to get their kids to eat properly, to eat vegetables and fruits. And, but a lot of times the kids just won't do it. And so moms actually are very thankful that they have Flintstones vitamins to give their kids because now they know they're getting the right vitamins and minerals and nutritions to the child. And let me read a letter to you from one of those moms. And so I pulled out a letter and I, and I read it to the Senate. And, and then I had a mailbag full of letters and I picked it up and I said, I have 5,000 more letters. Would you like me to read some more of them to you? <laughs> and she said, that'll be enough, Mr. Kalinske. <laughs> Nobody asked me another question. Well, the Mattel, Mattel guys thought that was hysterical. And so at the end of that session, they out in the hallway, they said, hey, we kind of like your act. Uh, why don't you come out to Hawthorne, California and interview for a position with Mattel? And so I did. So that's what got me to Mattel. And uh, I moved from New York City to, to Los Angeles. And uh, Hawthorne's this little suburb of Los Angeles. And uh, I started as a product manager on preschool toys, Jack in the Boxes, C and Says, uh, Putt Putt Railroads, Tough Stuff Toys. And about all I accomplished there, I did help grow that business. And, and I inter introduced the red and white packaging, which I think still uses on preschool toys today. And uh, one day, after working on this business and, and improving it somewhat, the founder of Mattel, one of the founders, Ruth Handler, walked into my cubicle, which happened to be outside the ladies' room, so it was, I got a lot of visitors, and, and, she, and she was a salty old character. She really, she swore a lot, and I won't do that part of it, but anyway, she, she said, Tom, the sales force says it's over for Barbie. Barbie sales declined last year. It fell from $100 million to $42 million. The buyers at the retail store say it's over for Barbie. The Wall Street analysts say it's over for Barbie. And they say it's time to go on to something else. What do you think of all that? And I said, Ruth, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Barbie will be around long after you and I are gone. She said, that's what I want to hear. I'm going to talk to Ray. Ray was my boss. I'm going to talk to Ray about putting you on the Barbie business. And so that was how I got on the Barbie business. But before she left my cubicle, I said to her, I said, Ruth, by the way, why do you think Barbie is so special? What makes her so great? And she said, 
because with Barbie, a girl can be anything she wants to be. And I ended up using those exact words, that phrase on packaging and promotions and advertising uh, from, from that day forward. And I, obviously I was put on the Barbie business. And uh, so your question, I guess, is what did I see and how did I turn it around? Well, I really believed in this brand. Uh, I, I really believed what Ruth said, that through a girl's imagination with Barbie, she could be anything she wanted to be. And so at the time, the brand was in really bad shape. And the, the reason, in my opinion at the time, was that the people on the business were so used to doing things the same way year after year after year. And they would introduce one new lead doll. They'd introduce one range of costumes or fashions for it. They'd introduce one low-priced accessory and one high-priced accessory. And maybe every three years, they'd introduce a new friend, you know, whether it was Francie or Midge or Skipper or whoever to the brand. And I thought, well, this is, this is nuts. You know, this is really, oh, and by the way, the packaging was all over the map. You know, Barbie was in a red package. Uh, her friends were in brown packages or green packages. Ken, I think, was in a brown package, actually. The accessories would be in yellow packaging. And so it was a mess at retail. Um, so that's what I inherited. That's what I walked into. And basically, I said, this is crazy, and we're not going to do it that way anymore. We're going to do things a lot differently. And uh, so part of the strategy was obviously putting all the packaging in pink, everything, right. to create a print wall at retail. And then I, I introduced a low-priced Barbie for, for a price range doll. I introduced a very high-priced, fashion-oriented doll, uh, did, did deals with famous designers like Oscar de la Renta, did action dolls, where, uh, you know, a gymnast doll. But most importantly, I did occupations. And so we, and I think the first occupation we did was actually pilot Barbie. And then we did Dr. Barbie, and teacher Barbie. And, and that got to this point that Ruth had said, with Barbie, you can be anything you want to be. And sure enough, the, the business fairly quickly turned around and we grew from 42 million to, I don't remember the exact numbers now, it's so long ago, but we literally doubled, went from 42 to 80 something, to 150, to 300, yeah. to, uh, 450 to 550 and, and it became a, obviously a very successful very successful brand right and so tom it sounds like in looking at barbie like clearly you aren't the target audience for barbie but what you saw was you saw the ability for that audience to aspire to something that, based upon like the the, the comments that you got from uh, from Ruth, was it? Ruth Hamlet, yes. Right. And so then that's, it seemed like that's what helped you map to different careers and professions and things like that. Exactly. And, and then maybe the other, like, it sounds like one of the lessons that I think is relevant today was just in terms of complacency, right? And so like, as a product manager in a lot of companies, it's like, there are these teams that are so used to just doing the same thing over and over, but sometimes it might be wise to, as you did with Barbie, like, look at how are the teams doing their the different things, their processes, and, and look at every area and try to see if there are ways of improving those areas. But would you say that's that's that, fair? That that's correct. I, I, and by the way, I, I really uh, agree with you on the complacency thing. I think complacency and arrogance are the two great sins that uh, product managers can make, <laughs> and uh, and right. often they make both at the same time. <laughs> and again, you notice in my in my opening remarks that once again, the experts in the industry, whether they were right. sales experts or retail experts or Wall Street experts, all thought it was over for Barbie. Right. You should give up, go on to something else. Well, that also was was wrong. It was just plain wrong. And, uh, and so looking at the business with a, a new fresh eye, I guess, and thinking about how do I segment this market? How do I segment it? So there's a, there's a real easy way for people without much income to buy a Barbie doll at a very low price, because I think it was $3.50 at the time. Or for those who are collectors and want real high price products, how do I attract them? Right. And then in the middle, how do I get uh, girls who are interested in becoming a doctor, perhaps, to play with Barbie, or, or they want to become a teacher to play with Barbie. Uh, and if for those who are more action-oriented, how do I do a, a doll that can actually do things, a gymnast doll, for example, or, or a ballerina Barbie that actually can dance. And so all of those segments of the market were right. what I went after, a very purposefully segmented the market. One example of that is something we did, which we called My First Barbie 
which was a doll that was very easy to dress for young girls because it only had Velcro snaps and, and snaps, no buttons, no, nothing hard to do, no, no tying of shoes or things like that. And so uh, that was another, another segment that we went after. Right, and maybe the general principle there, if, if, if I were to try and, and uh, generalize the principle that you're speaking to is that when you talk about experts, the real experts are actually the people who understand the customer, the audience. And one of the things that you were able to do is to understand who the customers are and then to cater the product or to change the products to adapt to each of the customer segments that you saw. That, that's, that's correct. Uh, okay. And also we were very aggressive again in, in marketing and advertising. Right. Uh, one thing that we did that, gosh, today it's probably illegal. <laughs> we did one of our competitors, Ideal Toys, who's no longer around anymore, so I guess I can say this. Ideal Toys brought out uh, a Darcy doll that, to compete with Barbie. And uh, they started to get some traction. They started to get some space at retail and what have you. So uh, we did a promotion that was basically turn in your Darcy doll and get a brand new Barbie for $2. <laughs> well... Guess what? <laughs> All these girls came into retail stores with their Darcy dolls and turned them in. And of course, this wasn't really too popular with retailers because they had to throw all these dolls away. And, uh, but it, it basically killed the competition. And it started something that I used to call the incipiency uh, 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 theory of, of marketing, where you, once they don't let them get a foothold, right. kill them before they get a foothold, stop the competitor in its tracks and, and Barbie did that back then and I think they're still trying to do it today. <laughs> yeah, it sounds a little bit similar to the Colin Powell doctrine, right? Like overwhelming force. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But, and then in terms of Hot Wheels, you kind of, those seem like two completely different products. Yeah, uh, they like, obviously are. Were, were you selected to work on Hot Wheels just because of all of your success behind Barbie or what was the story? Yeah, well, I just kept getting promoted. And so as you got promoted, you had more <laughs> brands under you. And so right, right. I, and I went from just preschool to having dolls in preschool and under me, Barbie dolls and other dolls under me, to then having uh, the boys toys under me, which Hot Wheels was a part of. And uh, it was kind of a similar situation. You know, they were used to doing things pretty much the same way. Right. And the business, again, had declined. And the marketing of it was, as you probably are aware, uh, Matchbox, which later I ended up working on, but Matchbox was an English competitor, and they were considered very high-quality, collectible die-cast cars, whereas Hot Wheels were considered very stylish and very fast and speed-oriented die-cast cars. And so the marketing of it was pretty much racing speed, uh, that sort of thing, which was okay, but it, it, it wasn't, uh, the play wasn't good enough, in my opinion. You needed to, so I mean, how many times can you just make the car go fast down a, a sidewalk or a, a living room floor? Right. And, and so we changed it a bit. Uh, we still kept the collectible aspect. Uh, we did 75 cars every year, one through 75, and uh, we tried to keep them stylish and tried to have the, the vehicles that, that boys were most interested in, whether that was Corvettes or Ferraris or Camaros or uh, Ford Mustangs or what have you. But we also introduced a play set that was very popular. And it, strangely enough, was a, a garage that folded into a case. And in the case, you could carry lots of Hot Wheels cars. Right. Well, this worked really well. It was kind of, in a sense, a hardware software strategy because once the boys got the garage, they wanted to fill it with Hot Wheels cars. Right. And so uh, that, that worked pretty well. And, and again, the business grew very, very nicely. I, I had a couple of very good product managers actually working on it for me and uh, very competent guys, very good designers too. I mean, our, our design guys were just terrific uh, on the Hot Wheels brand in terms of you know the right colors, the right uh, flames coming out of the back, that kind of thing. I mean, right. uh, they, they, they really knew how to style die-cast cars uh, very, very well. And so it, again, became a, a nice big business, a growing business for me, too. Right. And it, so it sounds like really the trick there was you saw that there was this desire for the audience to collect. And then in, in today's like free-to-play gaming 
business, we call it progression objectives. That you basically created like that objective, like on the map you want to get here. Yes. And so that's what helped drive the sales. So that's that's fantastic. All right. And then you guys launched a new brand, which was He Man. Uh, it'd be great to also hear the story behind. Oh, yeah, He Man. Story behind the story. <laughs> he Man's a great story. And so uh, at the time, Mattel, the only male action figure that Mattel had was a character called Big Jim. Now, Big Jim, uh, I don't know if you remember this at all, it never became a big brand in the United States. He had an arm when you when you flexed his arm, you could see the muscle bulge uh, uh, in his bicep. And uh, he was kind of an adventurous guy. They used him for, you know, play pattern in, in the jungle safari and that sort of thing. Well, meanwhile, Hasbro had not only G.I. Joe, which was a big business, but they also acquired the Kenner Corporation, which had Star Wars. Uh-huh. And so Kenner was just, uh, or Hasbro was a massive male action uh, uh, brand. Uh, they had both G.I. Joe and Star Wars, and we had Big Jim, who wasn't so big. And, and so, <laughs> again, back to research. We started right. with research. And we did uh, a lot of research on every theme you can imagine. I mean, everything. If you thought it, it, policemen, firemen, uh, Marvel characters, DC characters, whatever the latest TV show characters were, uh, cowboys and Indians. And, uh, and out of that research, this strange muscular guy with a enemy with a skull face, became Skeletor, uh, won the research. Okay. And uh, so after doing it, uh, the research on drawings, we actually physically uh, sculpted He-Man. And as you can tell uh, by my muscular physique, I didn't <laughs> sculpt him after me. Uh, no, that's not true. Uh, and anyway, so we then had models to research against uh, Star Wars and, and G.I. Joe. And again, He-Man was very, very popular versus the two leading brands in the industry. So we went ahead and, and we did a line of He-Man and his buddies uh, and Skeletor as an enemy. And he had a, a group of henchmen and He-Man and Skeletor would fight it out in Castle Grayskull. So that was the basic storyline. Well, the storyline was actually more elaborate than that. Uh, there was this Prince Adam in, a, in the planet Eternia who was a meek sort of princely guy. And he had this uh, rather shy cat. When he raised his sword and yelled, I have the power, he turned into He-Man. Right. And so that was the, the one of the things that we used in the original commercials and in the original comic book that we did. Uh, and Skeletor, again, was this, this very bad guy, always trying to do bad things. And so anyway, it became about a $75 million brand. Well, by then, by the way, I was president of the whole toy company. Right. And the chairman came into my office one day and he said, well, it's nice you developed this $75 million business, but it can never be a huge business the way Hasbro has a huge male action business because you don't have a movie or a TV show and you can't get one. And I said, do you want to bet? <laughs> so I, I knew this, uh, our advertising agency at the time was Ogilvy and Nader. And one of the guys who had left it was a, was a guy named Eddie Smart had worked in the television industry for years. And I, I worked with Eddie and said, how do we get a te- television show done? And we, we went and talked to CBS and ABC and, and NBC, and they weren't interested. So Eddie said, well, let, let's do it as a syndicated show. And I didn't even know what that was at the time. And he explained it to me. We were, gonna, we were gonna do a show that would be on after school at three or four in the afternoon or five in the afternoon. And we were gonna sell it to each local television station across the country. And uh, so I said, well, gee, well, how many episodes do we need? So we're gonna need a lot. And, and we figured it out, we we're gonna need 65 episodes and it was gonna cost us seven and a half million dollars to do. I go, wow, that's too much money. I said, well, we're gonna get a partner. And we went and visited Westinghouse, Group W Westinghouse, who owned a lot of television stations across the country. And they said, you know, it's a pretty good idea. We'll, uh, we showed them obviously scripts that Eddie had did, did off. And uh, we'll, we'll get this going. And so uh, we then worked with Filmation Studios to do the animation and do the production. We worked with a guy who's now famous called Chaim Saban to do the music. Uh, and of course, he's a billionaire today yeah. and Telemundo and a bunch of other stuff. And at one yep. point, he owned what was Fox Kids. 
And uh, anyway, so long story short, Mattel put up three and a half million dollars and Group W Westinghouse put up three and a half million dollars roughly. And we went around to the local television stations and instead of selling it, we gave it to them. And this had, I don't think this had been done before. And in return, we got, uh, you know, depending on the negotiation, but basically four or five spots per half hour that we could use for advertising, not He-Man, that would have been uh, illegal, but to advertise other children's products, or we could sell them. We could sell those spots to McDonald's or to Nike or to uh, any other children's company that was interested in, in advertising on this television show. So anyway, that's what we did. And lo and behold, we did not expect to make money off the television show. We did this to build the brand, obviously. And uh, the ratings were so high on the television show that we ended up making a profit off of the television show. And of course, the impact of the television show on the brand was enormous. And by the way, at the end of each episode of the television show, you know, after at the end of the 28 minute episode, there would be a moral message or an ethical message. So if the, if the show was about not bullying at the end, there would be a message about, remember kids, don't bully your friends at school or whatever. So, so we had a message at the end of each, of each episode. And the show became immensely popular. The brand grew from 75 million to $750 million. Wow. And uh, it obviously lasted a very long time. And every now and then they bring, try to bring it back. So far, I don't think they've done it that successfully, but I believe they're going to try again. I think I heard for next year. Right. Great. And so then that takes us to kind of the, the story behind Sega, which was pretty well chronicled in Console Wars. But... Maybe you could speak to what was the key reason that motivated you to, jo to join Sega of America and like what, what was it that you saw in the opportunity? Well, it, it, sure. I, I obviously was aware of Nintendo and Sega. Uh, I, was, I actually uh, had been involved a little bit with trying to do some products uh, for Nintendo. And uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't like Nintendo very much. To tell you the truth, I thought they were, they were, talk about a bully. They were a big bully. And they bullied retailers and they bullied the software developers and they bullied the licensees. So I wasn't terribly fond of them to start with. And then as, a, as the story in Console Wars goes, I mean, the Hayao Nakayama, the chairman and CEO of Sega, was yeah. very persistent in, in trying to attract me to the company. He had tried years before. Uh, yeah. We knew each other because uh, uh, you're probably not aware of this, but at one time Sega was owned by Paramount Pictures, oh. and uh, it, it, Sega reported to Barry Diller and Mike Eisner, and uh, Hayao Nakayama at the time was a VP of marketing, and so I, I knew him from those days because we did a lot of work with Paramount, and we try to license things to Paramount, and they would try to license things to us. So I had a familiarity with, with Sega from that time. And Hyo was just very persistent in trying to get me to join the company. And right. what really sold me was I had not seen 16-bit technology. You know, it wasn't really, it just had come out. And I flew to Tokyo, and I was knocked out by 16-bit technology in terms of the difference between 16-bit and, the, and the, of course, what I was aware of at Mattel was in television. And I certainly was aware of 8-bit technology, Master System and NES. And I thought this was just spectacular technology and that the gameplay was so much better and the graphics were so much better and the involvement was so much better. That's what sold me. I thought, you know, with this technology, this breakthrough, we really have a chance to take on Nintendo. Both of us have worked for Sega, uh, you in a much more prominent and important position. But one of the, I don't know if you noticed this, but when I actually visited Japan and I actually got a chance to meet Nagayama san, is that I, I noticed this kind of weird, well, not weird, but just kind of unusual characteristic of, of all the top execs. They all had some kind of animal thing, like, a, like Nagayama, he had like this eagle belt. And somebody else had like this bear statue and, and like all the top execs had some kind of animal thing. <laughs> I, I don't know if you, you, if you I noticed that as well. I, I did notice that. I thought it was strange <laughs> and it was some kind of a company. If you, once you got to a certain level, you had to be part of. <laughs> yeah, I, I should get one just to see if that, that helps me out in the future. But anyway, 
<laughs> and then maybe we could like just talking about some of the the situation for today and some of the brands for today and just even in terms of the video game space today some of the biggest video games are based on franchise ip like League of Legends and the League of Legends characters, Call of Duty, Madden, World of Warcraft. So in your opinion, how should game companies think about, you know, trying to build those kinds of brands for games? Well, I think it's very similar to the way we actually built a, a Sonic the Hedgehog. Okay. At, at Sega, you know, we, we had a, a really good first, first game, but in my opinion, Sonic 2 was actually the best game that, that during my time of being at Sega that, that was done. And so the point there being that you have a successful game, but then the next one better be even better if you want to keep that audience excited and happy and growing with you. And I think, the, uh, and, and I, I guess that, that you try to do that every time, right? You want to have your next iteration even better. And I would say that the Madden guys have done that very, very well for years and years and years. I mean, I, I think they might have had a couple of hiccups in there, but most of the time there was a clear improvement uh, in the in the Madden game that was coming out uh, for the next for the next year. And, and of course, the joke then became whoever they put on the package cover would would end up being a failure as a player the next year. But but uh, but the games itself were, were very very good. And I think that was true, certainly, it was certainly true with, with uh, what we did with, with Sonic. Uh, I think after I left, there were some Sonic games that, that weren't, so, weren't, weren't so terrific, but I believe they've gotten back on course and are now, again, uh, doing product that is, is, is an improvement each time. And certainly the, you know, the League of Legends guys and the World of Warcraft, those guys have really done a good job of improving on the product each time they, they bring a new uh, iteration out. And of course, the other part of it is timing. You know, got, got, got to get your timing right. You know, you don't want to do it too soon, but you certainly don't want to be too late when you're, when you're bringing it out. And of course, now, the, as everyone knows, the, the, the day you bring the out games is Tuesday, <laughs> but, which started, started with Sonic Tuesday. But anyway, I think that's quite, quite interesting. And, you know, in the case of video games, it's interesting to me that most of the time, the movies or TV shows that have been done haven't been great. I think the Sonic movie was terrific. I actually really enjoyed it. And I think, of course, the TV shows we did back in the early 90s were, were pretty good, too. But most of the time, the other companies have not done such a great job with uh, I can't think of a movie based on a video game that I really in, in enjoyed. What was that one with... Uh, Angry Birds? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now, of course, looking at today, I'm really interested to see what happens. What's the, what is, is Niantic going to do next with Pokemon Go? You know, what, what is going to be the, the new thing that they come out with to keep the Pokemon Go franchise uh, uh, growing? And my, my understanding is that everybody's still waiting for the next uh, headset, uh, AR glasses, uh, to, to be developed and there's rumors that Apple's working on it. So maybe that'll be uh, the direction that, that, that helps them uh, with, with that particular brand. So it kind of sounds like what you're saying with respect to brands is that there's gotta be this level of quality that you deliver, but also it sounds like in terms of continuing to have the next improvement, like a sort of heartbeat where right. you could think of a brand as kind of a living thing where you have to have that quality, but you also have to have this cadence of things happening with that brand. Well, and I think the other thing is that to me, most of these great games are based on, on a great story. You know, right. the, the Sonic story is a great story. Now, Madden's not a great story. It's just a it's great football. But most of the other brands are based on a story that uh, keeps evolving. And, and I think the, uh, the developers learn to find out what the game players within those games really liked. And then to use that, uh, use that more and more and more in the next iteration of that of that game. So I think a, a, a lot of this this is based on having great stories that people can relate to, people get really involved in. Uh, you know, a whole other segment of this is the the, the board game, uh, the, the Wizards of the Coast kind of people, that, where the story keeps evolving. All, all. Right. And, and and to me, that's that's a real important point too. To really understand the player, but also understand the story and how to keep it going. 
And, and Tom, you've kind of done two things. You've taken existing brands and revitalized them and you've yes. built new brands. And so when you think about both of these cases, can you tell us about what is your thought process behind the two? Do you think of them similarly or how should we be thinking of them in, ter in different terms? Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting question for me because I hadn't really thought about it that much other than to say I back on where we started with complacency <laughs> and yeah. arrogance. I yeah. think there, there, there certainly was complacency involved in many of the turnarounds that I was involved with because the, the product managers and the creative people had just gotten used to doing things the same old way year after year after year. They right. assumed it was the right way to do it. But yet the business results were not proving them correct. And so you have to come in and shake it up and do things differently. And then, of course, to, to the point we were talking about, do the research, find out what that audience really wants. What is the marketplace really looking for? Right. And figure out a way of delivering it uh, to them. I don't think everything should be based on research. I mean, I think pure brilliance is often uh, responsible for wonderful, wonderful products. And I think we've seen that in both the toy world and the, and the video game world. And certainly uh, our, our, our long departed now, Steve Jobs, didn't believe in research at all. <laughs> you know, He just wanted to do things the way he wanted them done. And it was brilliant and they worked. So it's not necessarily something you have to have. But in, in many of the cases for a turnaround, I think it's, it's important to have the data and the insights to know uh, what your market wants. Um, in terms of new, new games, new products, Maybe it's more, you start with just pure brilliance and you don't need as much research initially, but eventually you're going to need it because you're going to have to figure out how to keep that brand going. Right. So it kind of sounds like if you're thinking about either reviving an old brand or creating a new one, to your point about what we talked about before, if you understand that there's an opportunity with a customer, uh, with a specific audience, and then not really being complacent or trusting that the existing processes, the existing products in the market are serving those well, but if you can see where that opportunity is, then try to figure out how to best attack those markets with research, with what I guess what you're calling brilliance, your own intuition and things yeah. of that nature. I think that's I think that's I think that's right. And and by the way, the brilliance isn't often mine. <laughs> the brilliance is usually the designers or creative people sure. or even the uh, the marketing people that work for me. Tom, thanks so much for your time today. I have one final question, which would be, you know, as a former Sega employee, I'm going to have to ask, if you were running Sega today, what would you do? How would you revive Sonic to be even bigger than, than he is today? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I, you know, one of the things that shocked me when I saw the, the movie come out and how, I mean, it was the number one movie for two weeks in a row, I think. Right. Um, there was no new game. Right. There was no new game alongside the movie what an opportunity missed you know yeah. people who loved that movie would have probably immediately run to buy the game based on the movie and they, they didn't have it so they missed a they missed an opportunity there and and obviously i i feel very strongly about the sonic brand and i think they they should continue to do great products based on on sonic and his family of friends uh and I, I think that's something they are they're missing but one of the other things that struck me is when I think back on all, and I, I hear they are doing some things. I guess there was an article recently that Golden Axe is coming back. Uh, I think I saw something about that. I read something about that as well. Yeah. Well, uh, there's a whole catalog of original Sega IP from before I was even there, and certainly while I was there, a great product that they should, they could be re resurrecting. Because let's face it, the audience has changed dramatically, and as you know. Uh, over half the audience is now uh, well over 21 years of age. And I think the Sony says the average age of the player today is 31 or something. So there's a lot of people who remember back when they were teenagers and they played with this IP and would love to get their hands on it again. So I think Sega should, should open up that catalog of IP and really give some hard thought to how do they make some of these things come alive again on the new platforms where the graphics and the gameplay can be even better than it, well, far better than it was on, on the, in the 16-bit world, and and bring these products, bring these products back. I just don't understand why they aren't doing it. I mean, I, I one of my good friends is the guy who developed Echo the Dolphin. I oh, loved okay. Echo the Dolphin. 
why aren't they bringing back? Imagine Echo the Dolphin on the new platforms today. It would be, it was a work of art. It was beautiful back in 16, but imagine what it would look like today. <laughs> right. Anyway. Okay, th those are all of my questions, Tom. Again, thank you so much for your time. I definitely appreciate it. And there we have it, Tom Kalinske, the king of brands. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> well, thank you, Joseph. It's very nice of you to say, but I don't think I'm the king of anything. <laughs> Good to meet you are. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye-bye, Joseph. All right.